Oh, thank you so much to come to our workshop, which is on, as you know, social and economic justice issues on the internet. Now, the general, not the general proposition, but a proposition has been there that internet governance is something which will take care of this automatically because the internet is structured in a way that makes democracy easier, economic justice, rest of it will take care of itself. It's a kind of techno-optimism that has for a long time been something that people have held, the potential that the internet would bring democracy, the internet would allow people of all kinds to be able to propagate their views, their opinions. It will break the monopoly of the few, and so on. But the reality today is that we also see new monopolies emerge. We are seeing a kind of homogenization of the net by which English is now, I think, about 55 to 57% of the world's websites, while it's only 12.5% of the world's speakers. So you have this kind of disproportionate economic and social power coming into some hands. And I think that's something that we all need to really think about. So this is the genesis of this workshop. I will introduce the speakers who are on the dais. Parmidar Singh, who is from IT for Change, has been involved on these issues for a long time. And he's also the, one of the founder members of the JustNet Coalition. Then we have Pinder Wong, who has a really, really illustrious career. He's done a hell of a lot of things. I'm going to give only a few of them. He's one of the internet pioneers, the chairman of Verify in Hong Kong. He's been on the Global Commission on Internet Governance. He's been in various capacities in ICANN and IAB, including member of the ICANN board, 1999, and is active currently in web, pay web payments community. We have Cristina Gonzalez from the University of Sao Paulo. She is a part of the research group on public policies for access to information, special advisor to Brazilian Federation of Librarians Associations for Copyright and Internet Issues. And I have Norbert Bolos, Bolo, who represents the Swiss Open Systems User Group which is in Switzerland, the leading organization for open source software. So these are my four panelists. I would request Parminder to go first and tell us what he believes are the key issues in internet, on the internet regarding social and economic justice. Thank you, uh, Prabir. Yeah. Before getting into describing what are the key issues, uh, actual issues, and how they pan out, uh, I think uh, the way the workshop has been structured as well is about a problem of there not being an adequate recognition of this area itself in the internet governance space. And, and we, we would be using our discussions as a point of departure uh, of trying to go in a new and different direction. Uh, we should otherwise be so mainstream in current politics. It is in terms of every, uh, every political space and polity that social and economic issues are prime. But, uh, but in this area, because of the, some of the reasons which Prabir started to allude to, internet governance is strangely divorced uh, from uh, focus on social and, uh, well, uh, divorced from, uh, I mean, even conceptualizing economic and social justice issues. Uh, it's, uh, internet is recognized as kind of a technology which is beneficial. We have it, we can use it, and there's not much to be done other than to manage it. Like if we're living in an apartment, we have electricity connection, we need an electrician to make sure the connection is right and take care of repair, etc. the plumber to do the plumbing, and internet governance is those kind of management issues, uh, and there's not much else to internet governance in its very conception. But what is missed is that 
internet is causing huge amount of social changes around us. The social structures, the social systems are changing and the nature of that change corresponds to the nature of the architecture of the internet and internet governance should now move into these actual social structure changes uh, rather than about the plumbing and uh, you know electricity connection kind of management issues of the internet. Uh, one frequently hears in most of the discussions uh, that human rights should be included. Uh, in the end, they would say, let's bring in a human rights perspective is kind of a salt that should be mixed to food, uh, kind, of a, kind of a thing. But, and if you ask most of the groups involved here what those human rights are, they would say, yeah, of course, freedom of expression and maybe some privacy, but they would forget the pages and pages of human rights declaration in the United Nations, at the United Nations and other places, and huge amount of them being social and economic rights, cultural rights, the right to development, uh, which are completely uh, a blind, uh, not a spot, but a blind space uh, in this area. And we should uh, start uh, talking uh, talking about these things. Uh, I, I would briefly touch two or three areas just as illustrations, cultural diversity is so huge an issue as internet goes to the far corners of the world, the inundation of content uh, which is concentrated in the West in few countries causes some changes which are not beginning to be even understood and spoken of. Uh, there was a UNESCO treaty just a few years back which uh, says that cultural goods are not typical commercial goods and therefore the WTO regulations do not apply to cultural goods uh, and which has allowed many countries, France, Canada, but many others to have quotas of uh, films which could be imported in a year uh, in, in, into these countries. But what does that really mean in times of internet where the content flows on a daily, hourly and basis uh, with unlimited pipes? Not that I'm taking a position that it should be this way or that, but those kind of issues have not at all been articulated. Second is personal data. We hear a lot of, a lot of stuff about privacy as, as, a, as a kind of a negative right, but I think personal data is also a means of social control and also a personal resource. And there are no no formulations around understanding personal data as an economic resource, who's making money, whom does personal data belong to, and if, if so much money is being made on personal data, what kind of distributional aspects uh, should uh, be captured here. And it, it is uh, true in the case of what impact internet is having on health, education, etc. And I'll, I'll come back to the, some of these sub but the very fact that we need to start formulating a good part of internet governance and the discussions in internet governance forum specifically on these areas uh, is the point of departure which uh, I think this workshop is seeking uh, and we would uh, look forward to a discussion on, on this. Thank you, Prabhu. I would like, next like Pinder Wong to tell us what his views of internet is and listening to him I'm, I'm sure he's going to be provo provocative. Um, good morning, good morning everyone. Um, just to clarify that everything I'm about to say is my personal opinion and view so it's not reflective of any of the institutions that I'm associated with. Um, so I believe that the, the internet mirrors society and in some sense mirrors the existing injustices that are already present but in some instances actually amplifies them. And so my operating question is, or my, my, my sort of belief is the following, that um, technology uh, does impact society, I think that should be self-evident, and that the societal values need to be considered at the beginning of the technical development process and not at the end. So let me give you an example. Yesterday we had, um, so I'm interested in the development of web payment technology, which is to be able to use the internet to basically route money. Uh, the upside for that will be that you can send money like you send email, the cost of doing so being uh, increasingly trending to zero over time and hopefully that will unleash the new economics and the new kinds of um, opportunities to access value for the next one and a half billion people uh, to come online. Uh, the same one and a half billion people are probably also going to be the ones that are so-called the global unbanked. It's not economic for people to necessarily see them as being traditional banking customers. And so what we did yesterday was before the technical development of the actual protocol itself is to solicit the views of the people here at the IGF. 
the private sector views, the civil society views, and the government views. Well, why do we want to do so? Well, as Norbert will say, um, he has a big thing on spam. Now, the people who invented email, you know, what were they thinking? <laughs> you know, couldn't they not have foreseen the consequences of leaving out open relays and what have you? And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to avoid making the same mistake as with email for the payment for this web payment network using uh, in the process of its development. And what this means quite simply is that technical considerations can no longer be just about so-called security and the argument that, well, you cannot, without security, there is no privacy. I think that's somewhat false. In so far as, as we know from last year in Snowden, um, it doesn't take much skill to spy on an open network. Okay, it's open. Some, some would argue that if you're open, why do you need security? You're open. <laughs> Okay, so these are the kinds of tensions. So what I see in the technical developments is, um, if you look at the internet documents, there is uh, in these requests for comments and the technical standards, which is really the root of where a lot of the technical development occurs. There's a, a line at the very bottom called security considerations. Now, what I believe is the future, and what I would like to propose here is that in all of the policies that are being developed, that are, uh, that's that help, uh, I hate the word govern, but to help administer the internet, there is a similar RFC structure t to mirror the technical. Why is that important? Is because if a document looks completely different from the technical document, you're not going to get engineers to read it. You're not going to en get engineers to take interest into it. But in the new policy documents, these new what I would call RFC policies, or what we hear the last few days called best practices, there's a specific line. And this specific line is human rights consideration. And this is part of a standard document. In other words, any future policies come out must contain a line human rights consideration. And if we do that one simple thing, this raises the profile because the technology is to serve humanity, I hope. It's slightly different when there's machine to machine, but for now, we are the biggest users of the internet. Now, why is this important? So let me use another example. There are, uh, I play in the sort of angel space, and in, uh, how many of you have a smartphone? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> okay, I use a 2G phone. I live on the other side of the digital divide. Um, but for those of you who have a smartphone, in terms of mobile payment, there are, if you look at angel.co, angellist.com, there's over 800 startup companies developing technologies in mobile payment. Um, you may have heard recently of uh, uh, Amazon Local Register to have a, a, a cheap way of, of accessing credit card on your smartphone, or companies like uh, Square. But your smartphone these days has various types of biometric sensors. Fingerprint scan, right? Or maybe a voice print, or maybe a retinal scan, or what I would also see going forward is the cognitive profiling, which is how fast you touch certain buttons. And that's your private data, but it's captured some way. Now, what were the consequences of doing that? Well, let me share with you an example. There are startup companies that are looking at um, for example, attaching a device that monitors how much exercise you do and, mo and adjust your life's life, um, <coughs> life insurance premium accordingly. So what we're seeing right now because of globalization <coughs> is all this technical innovation and it makes things very convenient, right? makes it easy. And I would say that the pathway to hell is paved and make it, made very convenient. That cost of convenience has a consequence. So when you couple all that biometric information with payment, you may have unforeseen consequences. And we need to consider those social consequences, the justice, the economic justice of that up front. Let me give you another example. Um, in some countries now, to register for a SIM card, they need to take your fingerprint. Now, who made that decision? And where does this information reside? And what happens when the case, when that information, uh, the data repository is hacked? So the long and short of it is the social and economic tensions that existed previously, I would argue, are made worse 
by the internet. It's not the fact that the change is occurring, it's the fact that the rate of change is going to kill us. Why? Because our societies are not geared to adapting and evolving at the same rate. Now one can talk about the generational difference between, for example, the way my kids use computers and the way I use computers. The underlying assumption, though, is that should any of this infrastructure go away, like you lose your smartphone, there is an incredible, what I call, digital disorientation. So I would say the smartphone is not necessarily smart, because if you lose it, do you lose all your intelligence? So getting back to the point, which is technology development is designed to make things efficient, effective, et cetera, et cetera. But we have to clearly, somebody is responsible for thinking about the unintended consequences, the social uh, consequences of the technical development. It's not clear who, and it's not acceptable to leave everything in the hands of the engineers because we're all society, and they're good at designing protocols. So my concern is the future that we're building for, for example, our children will actually be form a form of digital slavery, what I call slavery 2.0 a slavery to the technology itself. In other words, should you take that technology away, will they be able to function in an analog world? They make their friends now digitally, sometimes superficially. If, they lose, if we lose power, and I, I like to use Thailand as an example, because my wife's from Thailand. When you become to depend on any infrastructure wholeheartedly, when that goes away, when the payment network goes away, when the electricity goes away, what do you do? Well, the irony with the internet, because of its so reliability, is that when it goes away, we're, we're not exactly sure what to do. Some of us, I think, we have a special responsibility. Why is this? I think we are the last of the analog digital generation. We're at that cusp. We can remember what it's like that when the power goes out, we bring out the diesel, we bring out the petrol generator. We know what happens when the computer goes down, we move back to the paper ledger. Our children do not have that experience. So when they lose the digital identity or the digital infrastructure, it is incredibly disorientating and incredibly debilitating. So my interest in the panel today is to avoid that. And that's up by, by basically telling them, look, you have to live and not assume that it's there. Don't over-rely on it. That's why I use an analog phone. Because I don't need the latest and greatest. I don't necessarily need to, to demonstrate that there's any kind of role model. I can function quite happily with voice. So, as I said before, I think the pathway to convenience leads a certain direction. And those responsible for building that path have a social, moral obligation to consider the consequences of their actions. It's not clear to me where, <coughs> where that dialogue should occur. I hope it occurs here at the IGF for the unique multi-stakeholder view. And by demonstrating that in yesterday's web payment, I hope that we're not going to make a colossal mistake with the web payment technology that we're doing. So please help us avoid unintended consequences by participating in expressing your views. Thank you very much. So Pinter has given us also what I will call a bit of techno-pessimism, that technology has amplified the existing social and economic injustice that that existed in the world. And I would argue that, you know, that's something we really need to address. I'm actually an optimist. And the reason why I'm, 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 I'm couching this in uh, rather negative terms, um, I do want to end on a positive note. So one last word, if I may. Um, the Internet is an entirely human construction. Barring the speed of light or the speed of gossip, which I'm not sure which is faster, um, there are probably no known constraints. In other words, the problems that we solve and the fact that we're having culture clash, generation clash, technology clash, all rolled into one on a very tight two minutes to midnight, um, the actual solution to these problems, I also believe, is actually in our ability to use the internet to find solutions. Thank you. So it's good that you gave that uh, 
finishing point because it's true that if we, if it is going to amplify and we are passive, then there is a serious problem. So obviously what you're also arguing is that if we don't do it right, then it can do the following things. And I think that's a very important point of departure. I will ask Christina now to tell us about her experience and her research as well as what she feels about these topics. Hello. Hi. Um, okay, good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation for joining this panel. Um, I'm going to give you some um, an overview on the key issues that we are facing now in Brazil regarding the internet, e economic and, and, and social justice development uh, related to the internet in Brazil. So I highlight some points and give you some data and bring some case that could show how, how information and communi communication technologies and internet could help us to, to develop and, and where it's not working very well. So the, the, the first problem that I would like to point out is uh, access to broadband internet in rural areas. When you look at the, the general numbers in Brazil, it, it seems like quite good when we have like 60% of access to internet in Brazil, but when you, you look at the regions in Brazil, like the provinces that are having this access, we, we, we can find like a huge disparity in that. In the north part of Brazil, we can find like only 36% of of, of houses have access to, to broadband. So I would like to, to say that access to internet is still an issue in Brazil, despite the fact that people, you are a developing country that's going, that puts itself at, in the center of internet governance and you are not facing these issues in public policies. And and despite the fact that only 36% of the north part of Brazil has access to internet, you have some heroes there, like the indigenous populations. They are uh, developing uh, great projects, uh, putting their material on the internet. I would like to point out that they are developing a web radio in Amazonas. And also they are developing open educational resource to, to spread information about their culture. So those are those are two good examples in how they could use uh, inf uh, information ICTs for development in, in this so small and isolated communities like the indigenous people in Brazil. Uh, the other point that I'd like to to highlight here is uh, the public and free access to internet. Brazil just abandoned the government just abandoned this this politics on telecenters and and public access uh, i've been, have been working i, I started working with libraries in, in brazil and we are trying like to 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 build a um, working group to to train librarians and to 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 convince uh, policymakers to use their space to expand ac public access to internet because when you look also when you look at the numbers also you you find that 50% uh, of the low income population in Brazil doesn't have access to internet and and 68% of this low income population don't have access access to internet or don't have a computer because they don't have a computer and why they don't have a computer like 48 percent of of these people don't have a computer because it is too expensive so if we you provide those people with public access to internet for example in libraries that where they have an infrastructure for that uh, you can like try to solve this problem that like almost have part of the low income population do not having access to internet or not having a computer. So the other problem is the software development in Brazil. We are extremely dependent on the NARS, on the developed country software uh, development. We have only two companies in Brazil developing free software and about like five companies developing na national, na national software. Uh, on the city hall, is that what say city halls? Like, uh, and, and the majors in the city will have a lot about uh, 
5,506 city halls in Brazil, and only 63 are using free software. So they are, again, extremely independent on international uh, companies on developed countries, uh, private companies. So why I'm saying why I'm talking about software because when we talk about the right to privacy and freedom of expression, it's really important to us to not be so dependent on United States. I, I know we have been talking here a lot since last year about the Snowden revelations, all the problems with surveillance. So it would it, it's also a development um, issue that develop the having like national f softwares and not being extremely dependent on, on technology. On, on ours technology. Um, so also our, our technology device and, and hardware is, 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 is you, ha you have no national production of, of, of hardware in Brazil. So it, it also makes us very dependent. We have some good policies like the, the CGI.PR policies with internet exchanging points. We have uh, almost uh, we have 23 uh, internet exchanging points in Brazil, which makes the internet more resilient, uh, faster, and some, sometimes ex expensive, but it, it doesn't solve uh, the, the privacy problem. Um, the other problem is the open, open access to research. Uh, um, we are also very, <laughs> it's, it's like a and speech about dependence, uh, is are very dependent on on the, the, the scientific publications from European and US based publishing house. And you have like five major pub publishing houses in the world and they sell these materials to un public universities in Brazil. But uh, we don't have some, most of the times we have to struggle with these publishers to, in order to, to, to have the right to store this research material in, in, in our libraries in our repositories and if you just not have a contract with with these publishers in, anymore uh, you just lost all the material that you have already paid so this is also a problem that you are facing now in Brazil and try to develop a more be a better policy on open access and copyright and another issue is the gender the gender issue i know some statistics says that we look at that and you have like uh, gender balance uh, like who have uh, 7% 70% of women having access to internet while you have 73 of the men having access so it's quite balanced but again when it comes to the development of software engineering and and things like that that are also impor important for economic and social justice we have only seven percent of women um, enroll as a computer engineer in universities in brazil so that's a, a pretty small number and so what are the the solutions <laughs> Well, of course, we advocate for more public policies on that, but in Brazil, uh, the government always uh, s presents like the private private public partnerships as a good solution. Uh, we are the findings are that some most of the time there is little civil society participation on those pub private partnerships, and also. Um, they are not very transparent on their results and 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 what are they are really doing? I mean, what's the the product of those par partnerships? So they spend the m the money that they are spending and, and things like that. So I will leave like for debate. Look, like, they have lots of issues, but yeah. Thank you, thank you, Christina, for bringing out the fact that even when the figures don't look so bad. They could hide really sharp disparities within that. So that's, I think, and the need, therefore, for policy interventions for different, in different ways in different areas. So I think that's a very important point. That's not enough to look at the numbers, but look at also what's happening behind the numbers. I'd only add one point that 
we must consider that for a lot of the developing countries, the access to the internet is not going to take place through the computer, but probably for that thing that Pinder was critical about, the not so smartphone, or the smartphone that makes us not so smart. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Norbert to tell us more about these issues, particularly what's happening on payments and other issues which are of vital importance to the world, that section which is not on banking. So how do you really address that? Pinder has already talked about, but Norbert is also passionate about that. So let him do that and also touch upon open source software. Thank you. I would actually start by mentioning that Switzerland, even though the Swiss statistics, they look wonderful, um, actually shares a lot of the problems that Christina has been pointing out, especially in my area of interest, which is software. We are also in this position of dependency. Switzerland does not like to be counted among the developing countries, but uh, really, if we are honest, I mean, we don't have Microsoft, we don't have Google. Well, there is Google, big Google um, um, plant, but still the decisions they are made in the US, we don't have control of the software on our computers except for the relatively few of us who like to use free software on our computers, we have some freedom. We can change the operating system when we like with the not so smart smartphones. It's a bit more difficult because they try to prevent us from putting the software that we want to put there. So that is the problem. Going back to what started this whole IGF process, the World Summit on Information Society, that actually also started in Switzerland in 2003. We had the first of these two summit events in Geneva, and there was a governmental declaration developed, and as civil society was not quite so happy with the direction that was taking, there was a civil society declaration that very clearly pronounced the very people-centric vision of information societies. So really, since 2003, civil society put out this banner, we want a people-centric thing, the opposite of slavery 2.0. To be honest, not so much has been happening with that. When we read that document again, it has aged very well. It's still a very excellent document. It has a very good section on free software, for example. Free in the sense of freedom. This is not a matter of price. It's a matter of the freedom to be able to change the software to make it do what you want. And that is also important for people who are not programmers, because they will probably know somebody they trust to give them advice. And if they're if it's free software, that trusted friend, that trusted person can give them something that they can trust. And you, you can never trust a corporation. That, that simply doesn't work. So in order to have a people-centric society, we really need to move away from this um, slavery type of software system. It's a, it's a whole business ecosystem. And we must move to a system that actually gives people the freedom they need in order to be able to trust whatever they have. Coming back to Switzerland, Switzerland has some advantages. One big advantage is it is a small landlocked country, which means it never had a naval power. It never was tempted to get colonies and make the world mad. It was always small enough that people never got afraid. Nowhere in the world there's a country that is afraid of Switzerland. So this gave us the chance to um, get a reputation of neutrality, a, a reputation for pursuing through diplomacy, peace, and understanding between societies. And I'm really wondering, maybe, maybe we could build on that 
and take a bit of a leadership role in the world in promoting free software, in promoting a vision of technology that is not greed-based, but that is based on the idea of actually asking the people what their concerns are, very similar to the standardization approach that Pinder has been promoting. So my question to all of you here is, what could be a vision for Switzerland to connect with the rest of the world, to engage in a way that could create some kind of global movement that moves us towards uh, this vision of a people-centric society, a society that is no longer characterized by technologies making injustice worse, but that is where there are useful governance structures actually directed to solving those problems to the extent possible. I would really like to hear from you on this and also ideas for very concretely applying the international human rights law that we have. We have human rights law and social and economic rights. How to bridge the gap between these wonderful instruments of international law and the practical things that happen. I would admit it's in Switzerland, like probably everywhere else in the world, the programmer does not think about human rights when he is hacking code. There, there may be a need to create some bridge between that. One idea I really appreciate, the human rights consideration section. Maybe there's more that can be done. I think I'll stop here and listen a bit to how you will react to this question. Much, Norbert. <laughs> and with that, we have come to the one-way communication that we have had till now. Now we hope to have the other-way communication that you tell us what are, what are the th issues that you think are important in social and economic justice on the internet and how do you think we can address them. So, the floor. Do we have uh, wireless microphones? Yeah, so let me let me be the runner. Who wants to who wants to go first? Are you a dog? Let me if there's no one gonna go. Any, anyone? Prashant is going to go. Prashant, ask a question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if nobody's yeah. <laughs> start the ball rolling. Okay, I, I'll start the ball rolling and then do the running. <laughs> okay. See the um, I mean, often the debates here is around multi-stakeholder model and all that. But what we have been increasingly seeing, whether it's discussions in various panels or anything, is like the predominance of the corporate sector. You have monopolies in various areas, then issues with software, with uh, things not being open, things people are not being able to change anything, I mean, prices being so high. So. Uh, especially when it comes to the area of internet governance and, and issues like open access and copyright, where there is like people are not able to access, whether when you look at the uh, developing countries especially, there's a problem with people not being able to access the knowledge online, people not being able to access because of the repositories are held by a few companies. So what is it that we can do to move this dialogue from a, let's say, corporate-centric dialogue to a more, let's say, people-oriented and um, which should help the society in a better way? Can I jump in there? I mean, in Hong Kong, we are working very hard to try and establish some form of uh, democratic selection. As you know, it's not going so well. Um, but we, before we, um, we learn to vote with our hands, in Hong Kong we, we learned first thing is to vote with our feet. And what I mean by that is that the power to determine what you buy is actually with you. And so you can always determine what you, what you install on your machine. 
but as I said, it may not be as convenient as some other um, um, software. So my point on the pathway to hell is paved with convenience is actually quite a serious one because it means that we all have to go and have to work and have to improve upon, for example, the open source stuff so that we can make it more convenient uh, on our terms so we know exactly what is running. And so the point here being is that what can assist it is always to, you have the power through your purchases to vote in some way on how um, the, you can might equalize or help uh, make less disparate um, the traditional business sector. And I'm not anti-business. Okay? I'm just saying that there needs to be some consideration by society on which, which trajectory. So open source is great, but you know, if you polish it, the rate at which you polish it, it can be as good, if not better, than uh, others available. Anya? <laughs> I've been volunteered, it seems. Um, I don't have so much a question. I'm just thinking about um, when it comes to open source, so I have a, a Windows machine at the moment, and it is actually a dual boot because before I had this machine, I used to Ubuntu for three or four years. I had to buy a new computer, and nobody got my mouse to work under Ubuntu ever. And there's a whole bunch of uh, luminaries of the open source movement in India and a few abroad who've looked at my machine, but nobody got the mouse to work. I think it's not just... Uh, I mean, the, the problem is much bigger than this is just a choice and you can make a different choice, right? It's also about the way hardware is configured. It's a whole ecosystem around it. And part of the reason, I think, why we're not able to change that is that everything said and done, I'm not convinced that there is enough of a push in the open source movement to really want to become mainstream. I actually meet a lot of techies who also have a real joy in being in their little bubble and being seen as the vanguard of a particular movement and being seen as the most progressive, etc., etc. And I think that also holds us back. I think there isn't um, enough of an effort to be really user friendly. So I use, for example, LibreOffice because it's not as advanced maybe as Microsoft Office, but it does all the things I need to do and I understand how it works. So it's, you know, that, that works for me. It's good enough. I don't need it to be perfect. But I think there are too many things where there isn't just enough communication. And so I think it's a combination of things. We, we criticize the corporations, but I think also the movements who work on these things, there needs to be more connections with other movements and other groups to actually open this up so that you get a broader movement where it doesn't just become like a culting that's cool, but something really beyond it. And I'm not sure even people in that cult, enough people in that cult do that. Some obviously do. It's just a comment. More questions? Can I react? Hi. Um, please, I'm sorry I didn't make this announcement first. Will you please? Identify yourself before the question. The last questioner was Anya Kovacs. The first question was Prashant Sugadhan. I'm introducing them because they did not. Hi, I'm George Fong from the Internet Society of Australia. Um, just a couple of comments. Firstly, I'm interested in the open source comment. In Australia, um, we've had um, a preponderance of commercial software, and I'm not sure that that's a matter of it being forced on people. Um, it's very hard for us to actually, in the open source world, and we're, uh, you know, my private capacity as an organisation, we are avid users of open source. Um, we try to promote it, but we're regarded as a little bit as like weirdos um, in terms of it's not Microsoft. Um, so there, the, I think I agree that there is a culture change that needs to take place. A very quiet culture change has taken place at federal government level, um, and people haven't really taken much notice of it. But the standard for documentation in the Australian government was, in fact, um, obviously doc format, anything that Microsoft put out. They changed that last year, and very quietly they snuck in a, um, a, a recommendation now that all government departments make their documentation standard ODF. Um, 
No, it, it went with a whisper, and the, the organisation, AGIMO, which is uh, involved with it, um, has effectively quietly put it out there, knowing that there is going to be a substantial amount of resistance to it, and um, our understanding is that they're taking a fairly subversive approach, so quietly it'll change that culture over time. Um, we've also tried to promote open source software within community and non-profit organisations, especially in areas where there are low socio-economic um, uh, status in, in, in places. The problem that we have there is that Microsoft almost always comes to the rescue and says, well, hang on, we'll give you a free or, or near zero licensing process. So it's actually quite difficult to actually persuade them that maybe an open source server for a non-profit organization is a better idea than having a Microsoft Windows server sitting in the corner. So I think there's a fair amount of, uh, of, of structural change that needs to take place in attitudes, um, and I don't necessarily think that's driven by the corporations. I think there's a culture out there that says that we like Microsoft, and it's the only thing we know. Um, just on a different matter, um, Pindar raised the issue of what happens if, um, um, if the internet goes away. Well, it did for a town in Victoria in Australia for a few weeks. The exchange in the, 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 the southwest city of Warrnambool burnt down. Um, it quite literally put the town uh, out of action for three to four weeks. Um, the financial impact on local businesses there was massive. It went, ran into the millions. And the social disconnection, um, it was well documented. There were a few comments, Pindar, that, uh, from, from uh, older members of the analog generation saying it was really nice to be able to sit down and talk to my kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the majority of people felt that the dislocation um, was significant enough to warrant a major inquiry into why the, 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 the exchange burnt down. And there are now um, serious discussions about how we make the, the net more resilient so that sort of thing doesn't happen. And, and as far as that's concerned, the local council took a leading role both in the social and economic rebuilding of what occurred. So it, it, it was very significant. And Pindar, you're quite right in pointing out that um, that analog stuff m needs to be sort of reflected. Any other? Luis. Hello, I'm Louis Pouzin. Uh, just a little point, you know, there are many things we could cover about the insecurity of the internet. But uh, let's say it like a, a, a small point. Microsoft is dominant. Microsoft is proprietary. XP is no longer maintained or distributed. My point is any software which is abandoned by the uh, producer should not be covered by copyright for 95 years. It should become automatically open source. It would be improved by volunteers. Interesting, Interesting legal point that if the government should actually do that, otherwise everybody locked into that legacy platform, there is real problems on that. Can I just jump in there? We, we will actually okay. have okay. the panel respond. I'm just misusing my power. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, so I'm going to throw in one more question. That yes, okay, free and open source software has its problems. Is there something that we need others to do, like governments, to support something which is not proprietary? Should we not have policies, like the Australian government talked about, that isn't there for a need for public policy and not just cult figures to promote open source? That's question number one for the panel. The second is, if free and open source is one answer, is that the only answer to the question of social and economic justice on the net? So what are, what are the other things we need to do? Who needs to do them? Can the panel address that? So I will go in the reverse order as I started for the response. I will start with Norbert first, then Christiana, then Pinder, and give the last word to Parminder. Apart from, of course, the chairperson. Moderator. <laughs> Okay, there were so many things said and asked that I would have liked to comment on. It will be difficult to remember them all. I will start with Anya's comment and ask a question back. Yes, but how? Um, in our group, in our community, there have been quite a few attempts to convince um, other civil society groupings to try and join forces in some way 
um, not only by trying to convince them to use free and open source software because it's somehow more civil society um, ideology compatible, but um, there have been lots of ideas and it hasn't really worked so well. So we are quite interested in ideas that will work for this. Um, I would comment a bit on the idea that maybe the governments should do something and this is actually very much related to the broader question of society because in a de democratic society, at least in the ideal, there will be a public discourse that informs the actions that governments take. We all know that the concrete practical existing implementations of democracy are not quite um, that totally um, based on the public discourse. They are to a significant extent based on lobbying the companies that have a lot of money and that is typically the companies that have some kind of lock-in, some monopoly position. They milk that monopoly to get money and then they use that money to lobby the government so that the government cannot do anything that would r endanger their monopoly. This is this kind of vicious cycle. So one thing that has been done in Switzerland is to create some serious lobby work. Um, there is, since a few years, a parliamentary group on digital sustainability. It's an official parliamentary group of the Swiss parliament. All of the major political parties have some members of parliament who participate in that group and they regularly make interventions in parliament to promote open standards and open source and all that. Also, privacy and a lot of other good topics come out, out of that group. So that, that is one way to try to bring this whole kind of concerns into a mainstream political debate. Another issue is that if we hear about open source simply not being user-friendly enough, I think we need to recognize that making something user-friendly takes a very significant investment. It takes, it is relatively easy for a programmer to hack together a bit of code that does what he wants it to do as long as the person using it knows exactly what happens inside. <laughs> it, it, it's not so easy to remove those assumptions. It takes investment. One way to get that investment is actually for governments or really any large customer to say we want something that has good usability and that is free software. There's no reason why that cannot be said and if the demand is there, then producers will be there. Put out public procurement for a system which has this and this and this properties which must include usability, which must include a free license. And if you do that, what will happen is you will not only get software, but you will also get local competence. Because if it's free software, suddenly it will not only be the big international technology companies who have the competence to deliver and develop and improve such a solution, it will also be local comp companies. When you create local demand, for example, by means of a government policy of procuring such a thing, then you also create local competence. I think it's a pretty promising development strategy, not only for this kind of developing country where I come from, Switzerland, but also for the more traditional type of developing country. don't like Switzerland suddenly becoming a developing country, particularly after what you've done to the banking industry for the last hundred years. But we let that pass. <laughs> I wish the... Is that right? Working, okay. Um, on the questions about... On the question about... Uh, 
pop policies and what could be done. I mean, on what could be done, I think you have so many layers of actions. Uh, you have like the law reform, so we could work for um, copyright law reform on in the national, international forms. Because in Brazil, co uh, software is not protected by copyrights, it's patent. Um, we, we could have like fight for our public policy so it's connected to our relationship with governments and how we are going to pressure them and how how democratic institutions really function in the country so what are the channels for participation and influencing those pub policies uh, in brazil we have uh, the labor's party which is kind of open for forums in for more in for inv inviting the civil society and experts on to develop more public policies but they're just mostly are more consultation for so uh, so this layer of public policies is possible but we also have to to take in account the fact that in the as you said um, you have lots of lobbying and pressure from from developed countries, from governments, and from the public sector. So we try to implement a policy uh, of free software use in, in public administration. And then the, the, the Microsoft just pressure politicians and they abandon this, this policy. So yes, we are, we are, sometimes you cannot like, confront these companies. And the other layer could be the training and the, the, the for to, to overcome the digital literacy problem, and that's also related to how to make people more engaged in coding and more um, and, and get close to the to the free software logic and 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 the, the spirit of that. I, I, I don't. I don't agree very much. They are not very user friendly. I mean, th I know in general terms they are not, but they have improved a lot in the last years. Like you have Ubuntu, you have Mint, you have uh, some so many interface user inter interface that are, are are helping us to use more more soft free software. So. Um, yes, it's hard. Technology is hard. All this internet governance is is difficult. Requires lots of technological uh, knowledge. But um, I pretty much agree. You need to to, to do more training. To, but we sometimes we don't, do not have the the human resource, uh, neither the the economical resource to do that. So it's uh, so that's the other layer that I'd like to talk about is like the activist layer. I mean, if you are a free software activist, I mean, if you are a user, just talk to your friends, to your family, to the ones that are close to you. I did a lot of that in Brazil, and I have lots of people that now are using free software, and they are free software activists, just because as in the individual level, we can do lots of things also. And yeah, yeah I think that was that. Thank you. How many of you remember a program called WP5? Word Perfect Five. Word Perfect Five. Five. Uh, five so you you had money. Um, Louis raises a very important point, which is, for example, the expiry of XP. And so I make two observations. Should we lose those platforms? We're actually losing access to a lot of our heritage because we lose access to the computing systems that capture that information at that point in time. And so I think the suggestion of looking at how um, proprietary software uh, falls into the public domain uh, needs to be have some serious consideration. And so I would look at shortening the period of copyright from the 50 years, which is where it is in many countries, to a period of five years. Why? Because I, I've got nothing against Microsoft. I think they do some write some great software. They innovate, and that innovation needs to be rewarded. 
but the time that they have to, the, the, I talked about the rate before, which is the rate of innovation. Five years software is a long time in the software industry, and their ability to monetize that probably is going to be maximally 80% or something like that in the first five years. Why? Because of the rate of change. And so I think one of the root problems is the length of the copyright period, which in theory, after the copyright expires, things should fall into the public domain. If you have a construct where it's 50 years, well, 50 years, we were probably doing things with vacuum tubes, <laughs> right? So you cast 50 years ahead with the technology cycle and mobile. The reason for also um, being very focused on open source is to be able to access to those content that were developed at the time. So copyright and the period of duration of copyright, I think, is one thing that has to be seriously looked at. Having said that, I believe in peaceful coexistence. So this is my laptop. It's Zen. It's a hypervisor in which I run a Windows virtual machine together with five other machines, one running Ubuntu or what have you. So they can coexist. And that polish you talk about, that's a lot of work, and that does need to be rewarded. But the question is, after the period that it reward that you reward, and you've you've invested your infrastructure on it, and that platform goes away, like an XP, that's a social consequence. That's a huge social cost. So what does this mean? It means that the problem is with the accountants. Okay, I think we need to really seriously look at how we align incentives by changing the way we keep score. If we purely value things in the well-known monetary terms, and if we always boil things in monetary terms, we're missing most of the problem. Let me give you an example. If you had to pay an hourly wage or rate for the time that your mother spent raising you, how much is that worth to society? So I believe that a creative accounting and looking at the ways that we change how we measure the societal contributions does need to be looked at. Let me give you another example. I'm trying to, I, I int helped introduce uh, Creative Commons to Hong Kong. And we've been trying to introduce copyright exchanges to legally license copyright instead of ripping people off. The interesting thing is going back to the payment issue, the cost of routing money. Why? Because again, if you're trying to license a photograph for 50 cents, you may take you $20 to route the money. So that's why I'm interested in the payments aspect. But the accounting aspect, the United States last June changed to um, a new accounting measure by the UN that has uh, an alternative measure for the value of intangibles, these intangible assets. And their GDP numbers went up by equivalently of a small country in Europe. That's purely by the change in how to keep score. So I think the creative aspect is how do you align interests for societal interests, maintaining the commercial interest in um, innovation, but rewarding both. And I think that it really is an accounting issue. And society can decide how we reward that. And the example, recent example, is uh, the, how, the measurement of the value of intangibles. The other reason why this is important is what do we trade on the internet? We trade intellect, we trade uh, information goods, virtual goods, right? digital content. And that's owned by somebody by nature of copyright. And so we have a very, we have a, a fundamental economic interest because unlike the analog world, the digital world, effectively, we have an unlimited resource. Un well, we're limited by our creativity. Whereas the physical world, we are limited by our access to natural resources. So if digital economies and developed economies like Switzerland um, can continue to grow, they must find a way to measure the production and sale of non-tangible, intangible goods, because that can also continue beyond their access to resources. So fundamentally, how we measure, measure the societal, these intangible contributions, what I would largely call an, in, uh, uh, an accounting issue, is how I believe it's the key to aligning societal interests and corporate interests. Thank you. It's an interesting issue that we actually treat 
the tangible resources, the common resources like air, water, and so on, as if they're infinite. While we teach, we'll treat the digital world, which is infinitely capable of reproducing itself, as if it is finite. So we have this fundamental dichotomy, and that's really created by property. So that's where it comes from. I will ask Parminder to now give us his views on the topic after having heard all the questions and the participants. He almost gets the last word apart from me. There's a huge amount of time we're going to leave to the moderator today. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the questions and I remember the top ones and I'll try to respond to them. And uh, I mean, Prashant was talking about, uh, about how to move away from a business-centered uh, dialogue uh, in the internet governance uh, space. And many of the discussions later on, including the last one of Pinder, about we should evaluate things uh, you know, in a different manner, but that being recognized as a need, but who can do it are the highest political systems uh, which can only do that kind, uh, kind of a thing. Uh, and, and it's important to see that the last about 10 years of the internet governance dialogue has coincided with a huge amount of uh, the lost paradise of the internet period when the consolidation and centralization of the internet has taken place. And if we, if we try to analyze how the dialogue took place in the IGF and many other places, and the consolidation of the internet, and they're very, I mean, kind of lessons you learn about how that dialogue is divorced from what the has, is the problem going on outside and how little that dialogue is about uh, that consolidation on the internet governance shape and how much that dialogue is inward looking about multi-stakeholderism which has allowed businesses to come in and make the whole uh, discussion driven by business interests and keeping away issues which could otherwise trample on the consolidation of the internet power uh, by those, those very businesses. And, and when you capture the discourse, you have captured the most vital uh, layer of the whole political activity. And we heard Christina talk about uh, localizations, various kinds of localizations, and Norbert talk about the benefits of social economic benefits of those localizations, but how easily localization can be made to look like fragmentation of the internet, and then, no, you can't do that, and obviously there are slogans and banners uh, out there that you're trying to fragmentize the, the digital ecosystem or internet, which is its central uh, artifact and therefore this capture of discourse and I, it's greatly directed towards the interest of those few digital corporations who are consolidating uh, on the internet and we need if as a single Im most important uh, imperative to move away from this business dominated discourse to a public interest dominated discourse where people who come into a dialogue are basically thinking not about their own interest which is the stakeholder theory but about a higher public interest we all know it's not easy to capture what public interest is and the whole political system exists to figure that out but at least you step in for the purpose of public interest and not private interest and be, with, without that happening we're not going anywhere second question i remember was anya's about using free open source software and the responsibility of the community and i think uh, this uh, the allocation of roles to the actors have to be considered with, in some depth. Uh, I think the role of whatever is called community or people or activists in general are to create alternatives and push policies and ch make structural changes. And the structural changes are made by the governments and the political systems. And I, I, it's very difficult to put the responsibility on the movement for failing to do this or that. Though when we are internally sitting as activists, we can do those uh, discussions. Uh, but I mean, I, there's a limited capacity which a movement has to build the techno structures of this world. I mean, we cannot be thinking that they should, it's the health activists who should be producing good medical practices and should be monitoring health practices and so on. They can make models, but finally it goes to the policy area. And the talk we have had about ODF and, and the Microsoft doc, and, and a simple, I mean, it's, I really see the biggest feeling of policy that in the last 15 years, uh, no policy makers, not in India, at least, and most developing countries I know, could enforce a simple thing on Microsoft that you have a 
dot ODF reader, which is the simplest thing, a simplest policy enforcement. You have an ODF reader. We are not even asking to go any further, but if somebody gets an ODF document, he should be able to open it on that system. This simplest policy thing has not happened, and because of that, I could say that the percentage of people who would have liked to use Ubuntu and other Linux systems would have shifted 10, 20%, because I know a lot of people whose main problem is that, okay, when I, I send documents out in ODF, the other guy is not able to read it, and how long can I keep on sending documents in the ODF? The very simple policy, things has not been po have not been possible because Microsoft has been able to work its way into the corridors of power and controls the policy making. And what multi-stakeholderism has been doing is to give them more and more access. Worse than in Microsoft era, in the networking era, we all know it's Google, which is the Microsoft plus 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 of the network space that earlier at least the civil society was very blunt in saying what Microsoft is about, but if you go around in IG spaces today, including in the IGF, Google has so well used the multi-stakeholder principle, method, practices, spaces, that it blunts the civil society's uh, uh, actions and pronouncements of what needs to be said and therefore we enter a world of new normal where we have started to accept uh, very unequal systems and again I would say that the biggest thing needs to be done is to give a pushback to the people who are responsible for big concentrations on the internet and distortions of the internet and get business out of major public policy discussions and dialects other than listening to them as the information which they have to provide, but this dialogue should be a public interest dialogue for us to move forward. I'm not going to give a long, uh, use up all the remaining minutes, I'll just finish very quickly. Ani, you want to ask something? Go ahead. Okay. Okay, we have time for the response. Uh, Anya from the Internet Democracy Project in India. Um, I just, I, I completely take Paminda's point that there are a whole lot of stuff that could do, be done on the policy level when it comes to open source. And I also, the person from Australia was talking about uh, how much of a difference it can make if gov there is a lot of government uptake. We've also seen that in parts of India, so I think those are really important things. I was earlier responding though to this idea that we have a choice. I chose open source. But if I would have stuck to that, my computer would still not be doing anything, or I would not be able to use it. So that was my point, that we make it seem as if it's just a choice, and actually that's not true. And if somebody like me, who has so many contacts among techies and people who are part of that movement and who are willing to spend some time to just look at my computer and don't ask payment for it, doesn't get it to work, what does that mean for the average person? So I think just the way things are at the moment, we shouldn't overestimate what we can do there because it isn't working seamlessly enough for the average person. It is not a, a real choice at the moment. That's the point I wanted to make. I don't think that. No, I, I'm just saying that I think that's a point which I think Norbert has also addressed that essentially to make it user friendly, make it seamless, there is a need for investment. And unless public policy changes and there are ways to channel investment. It's difficult for geeks to really solve the problems of the world and that's I think a given. So it's really the ecosystem which we need to address in a larger way. I, I'm going to... Uh, yeah, may, may I say something? Just bear. Why not we start to develop like uh, open hardware? Maybe this could be a good policy to help this problem. It's yeah. yeah. an idea also address the other problem that unfortunately proprietary software is tied to proprietary hardware and that's what makes also creates a lot of problems but I will really not address the specific issues I'll only say that what the discussion has said is thrown up the following needs if I may say so that one is that you need national policies to support free and open source initiatives I think that's something that is clear, but they're at the national level because governments can do that. It's not at the international level. Internationally, we can push for this, but it's really at the national level that we can do it. We had a big international battle on the document format. 
Unfortunately, it became 50-50, so we won't go into that. But really, it's a national battle that we need to fight. Similarly, when you, take, when you talk about how the internet has to have justice built into it, what Pinder was talking about, Norbert talked about it, that techies have to be addressing issues of justice when they do the code. If you really take that into consideration, again, issues, for instance, net neutrality, which, which really address some of the issues that are coming out that you should not be able to use the net unfairly. Again, they are national issues in the sense that all the countries today have laws which deal with these issues or regulatory system which deals with these issues and we need therefore to really fight at that level. The last point and I think to me that's a very important point that we need to also address that originally internet was supposed to be connecting the edges. Now, if you connect the edges, then each edge forms comes into under some national jurisdiction and therefore you can control them. Today, as the internet gravity, center of gravity seems to be shifting to YouTube, to Facebook, to various other platforms which are there, and finally the cloud, what is happening is very clearly that all the major cloud or internets big companies are essentially from one country, and which is the United States. If it is from one country, then only regulation that applies on it, only laws that apply on it are then the United States laws, no other laws. And one of the consequences when you come to things like mass surveillance is 4% of the world may have the Fourth Amendment protection, but 96% of the world does not. So I think these are the issues which demand if the center of gravity of the internet moves to the, to the middle space, as it were, which is controlled by the United States, unless you have international treaties, international regulations, I don't think we can curb either the police power, the security power of the United States on the net, or we can curb the monopolies on the net through regulation, which you can do nationally. I don't think we can do it internationally, particularly as the US policy today is Monopoly is not too bad. As long as it helps the American economy, they're really not going to address it. So I think we need both from the point of view of mass surveillance, which has been at least a big issue with the Snowden revelations, but also for economic reasons, we need to think how internationally we can address the monopoly power of certain companies through international regulations, if we will, and therefore the need for international treaties, not only taxation, which is being discussed, but also the monopoly power of the companies. Net, for instance, we talk of net neutrality. What about platform neutrality? What about neutrality of ranking that Google provides by which it can make one company much more profitable, profitable than the other and that company could be its subsidiary? So these are the things we need to think about how to do it. And I think there is a huge policy space for global issues which we still have to tap with the new emerging architecture of the internet that we are seeing. And of course, we have already the issues like open hardware have been flagged, legacy software, and I really think the five-year uh, uh, part for software, copyright issues have been flagged, and it's not 50 years, Pinder, it varies from 50 to 105 years. So, <laughs> so it's really all those issues we need to address. Thank you very much for coming here. We have thanks to all of you for listening so patiently to all the speakers and also asking questions. Thank you.